<clears throat> thank you. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure and honor. And with great sadness, uh, I have to say I, I could not make it in person this time for the conference um, in Israel, in Barilan, uh, hopefully next year. And uh, congratulations to the entire organization team and uh, warm warm regards to everybody who is there in audience, all the friends that I could not meet in person. I hope to see you very soon on other um, conferences and then next year again in Barilan. Um, my name is Evelyn Bischoff. I'm a medicine uh, doctor and professor of medicine in Switzerland and in China. Originally, I'm from Germany and I'm an internal medicine specialist and oncologist and also longevity physician, if one may call uh, him or herself like this for the past several years uh, in the field of healthy longevity medicine. And it's my great honor to speak today a bit about uh, the clinical application of healthy longevity, specifically um, about optimizing the performance and restoring the biological age of an individual to a optimal individual peak performance. So myself, again, um, in the longevity field, but also with one leg in the so-called sick care or our reactive medicine, 100% uh, clinical, but also engaged in research and, of course, in education, which I am extremely passionate about. In terms of my disclosures, I do not have many, but I have to disclose that, again, I'm also a doctor uh, in a university hospital, have always been in the hospital setting, and I'm dealing a lot with complex cases, with multimorbidity, uh, now more and more with uh, complex ICU cases, also with... Recording in progress oncological patient and also surgical oncological patients. And sometimes it's really great, it's fun. It's a very different type of algorithm that is running in our heads in the world when we are trying to make differential diagnosis and medical rationing. At the same time, we see that there is a huge shift and change in the field of medicine, which is coming, of course, with the big data, which is coming, of course, with the generative AI that I will also mention um, in, in, in my later slides, and with generation of new type of data sets of every patient longitudinally. And I see ourselves, physicians, clinicians, as those people who will not only cross the bridge, but also actually create the bridge between those two type of medicine, the reactive and the new frontiers of healthy longevity medicine. Therefore, um, the journey is pretty much like mine between Switzerland, uh, my University Hospital of Basel and Shanghai, where I am right now. It's this disbalance, right, between um, idyllic, peaceful and very, very fast, rapidly evolving um, field. When I you know, I'm opening my speeches mostly with this slide and I, and I, and I still stick to it. Uh, hopefully this will change one day. Um, longevity medicine is for me a field that is constantly evolving at a pace that is almost unreachable for humans, especially for physicians that anyway have to keep up with, with, with the updates in the medical knowledge. So it's like in Alice in Wonderland, you have to really run double as fast to actually move and bring the field forwards. Otherwise, we really have to just run extremely fast to keep up with the, with the speed, with the pace. And given also the multidisciplinarity of uh, longevity medicine, as you know, you know, with geroscience, with biological, biological sciences, with computational sciences, with public health, and many others, um, we are facing a very new type of a challenge in terms of CME for physicians. And also not only for physicians. So I'm now talking very clinically oriented, but for patients, it's uh, it's just as much important as for scientists and any collaborators in the industry and beyond in the field. So when we tried to um, define longevity medicine um, back in 2020, actually this article was published in 2021 in January in Nature Aging. Um, I had the great honor and pleasure to, to, to contribute to this uh, piece of uh, Professor Javoronkov and uh, Dr. Kai Fuli, the godfather of artificial intelligence. And at this point of time, we um, try to frame uh, this discipline as a branch of precision medicine that is specifically focused on promoting health span and lifespan and is powered by AI technology. And here, of course, we're focusing a lot on generative AI, GANs, and uh, aging clocks, here specifically also deep aging clocks. 
but I guess, you know, as time passed, as um, newer, especially clinical approaches came into the field, a type of a new um, or additional definition was um, created in or by a society that um, Professor Andrea Meyer and myself were working on and uh, together with a recording stopped executive committee created uh, and officially opened in August uh, last year. So on, on the 8th of August, 8, 8, 2020. And in our small consensus, not to claim that recording uh, in progress this is 100 present the binding definition for, for all, but we try to frame it at least for ourselves for developing of protocols and recommendations, guidelines and quality control settings and evaluations in the future. The definition of healthy longevity as follows. It's an optimization of health span by targeting age-related processes along the lifespan. And we were hoping that this was, will encapsulate really what healthy longevity is all about. It's targeting health span and not curing it, but actually optimizing it by targeting the age-related processes, hallmarks of aging and beyond along the entire lifespan. And um, everybody who would like is welcome to join the Healthy Longevity Medicine Society. You can find information on this website, hlms.co. And that's the executive committee, some of the guests that are also speakers at this great conference and beyond. So uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Meyer from Singapore, we have Professor Pinkus from Colombia, we have um, Dr. Randall from Stanford, um, Dr. Kirtland from Mayo, and Dr. Bartzilla, of course, from New York, Einstein University, and myself uh, in Switzerland and Shanghai. Now, moving on, AI in medicine um, is something that came at a time that really helped us physicians to accelerate and augment our constant learning and translation of our learning into the practice. So what we are seeing now is that every person almost is developing a sort of a tertiary digital layer. Everybody has an email, everybody has uh, some sort of data set that they are collecting, including medical data, but also pretty much any other information that will be valuable for us physicians to evaluate as epigenetic information. And so, um, and so we believe that in this development, we need to work together with the AI. So it has to be a symbiosis of human intelligence and artificial intelligence in order really to create this type of digital extension of the humans and create many of the tools that will be applicable in healthy longevity medicine. But the path towards this, so the AI longevity medicine or generative AI evolution was not always very easy. And uh, we all remember how difficult it was at some point of time to even accept the concept of generative AI uh, into the longevity field with the guns, etc. But when we look at the at the span of this evolution or almost revolution, we can see that number one, it's a relatively short period of time where longevity medicine has boomed. And we see that the, the moment of um, really the highest pace of evolution was around 2015. So of course we have 2013 Harvard's clock, it's something that, that is so extremely important for the entire further development and the nine hallmarks of aging at the time that now of course are expanding. Um, but around the time of 2015, when the deep learning technologies came on top of um, the basic AI, this is where the AI in medicine really start to boom. And this is where we were then able to really analyze all the data sets that were out there and create new data sets and focus on now also on the omics and also together with the development of robotics and all the wearables to develop further tracking, continuous tracking, and to actually then further evaluate uh, those, uh, those data. Biobanks were created and uh, started to provide longitudinal data for validation. And what we are seeing and really applying now in sick care and in healthy longevity is in a simplified form, what we see here, we have a variety of data for everybody on an ongoing base. Optimally, continuously, day and night, longitudinally. 
and optimally also in a way that is standardized. Of course, we are very far from that, but definitely we have at least a high dimensional data set already available for, for many people, not only in biobanks, but also in the real world from the epigenetics uh, through the entire system and tissue levels tr through gen genomics, of course, uh, the entire functional diagnostic, the entire uh, cognitive diagnostics and so on. And this high dimensional data set is now finally um, digestible by the learning methods in AI so that we can have a functional objective function that will come out of it. For example, development of targeted therapies, for example, the development of individuals' diagnostics and so on. Of course, we are trying still to optimize it and we are on the way, but as we can see, some, all, some further technologies have helped us. So beyond um, deep learning, we also have the transfer learning and federal learning and, and other ways where we can really optimize first of the objective function, then integrate a lot of multiple features that we want, shift them and scale. And that is probably the top word of what right now is being further developed, right? not only with ChatGPT, but also with, with other tools of generative AI we are able to use a variety of data, uh, very granular data from imaging, from blood tests, from behavioral tests, uh, from genomics, omics, and so on, through the deep neuronal networks and other type of um, learnings into something that is really functional in the lab uh, or in the clinic, like pathways and targets for drugs, like a synthetic data, further questionnaires, uh, and of course, tools and base of um, interventions. And this can be further granularly developed into um, longitudinal setting for everybody from the young to the old age and also through different types of tissues and so on. So this is um, almost an infinitively uh, granularity based. Of course, there is a caution that we have to have with AI, especially uh, in terms of accuracy. So uh, as much as we should integrate and use and work with the AI, especially generative AI in the medical field, it should also be something that uh, should still be controlled and checked um, by a human person. There's a good article in Nature Medicine published just very recently on that. And I guess in the question of caution versus progress, it's still very important to have the progress in mind and uh, with a caution in the back hand so that we can still advance as we did in terms of healthy longevity medicine, where we still have, of course, reactive medicine, where reactive medicine will always uh, most surely be a present because we have to have treatment of diseases that is out there. But also the development of prevention has been out there for several decades and preventing diseases, detecting diseases as an early, early uh, stage is extremely important. However, we have moved a step ahead or a level ahead, call it as, uh, as, you, as you please. But the point here is that we are not detecting the disease at a very early stage, but we are actually detecting the risks of potentially developing a disease at a specific frame of time in life. And at this point, mitigate those risks. So not allowing them to develop too fast. And hopefully at some point of time, so also to prevent them fully and eliminate them from the medical history of a patient. Very often we hear, oh, healthy longevity is for, uh, for elderly and it's all about um, the aging uh, society. And yes, it is somehow related, but healthy longevity is not about geriatrics. It is integral and it is important, and it is actually targeting what geriatrics is treating right now, frailty and so on. But at some point of time, we will have to shift our mind and say, okay, we have definitely a span of different functionality of elderly people. And what we are trying to do in healthy longevity is that at some point of time, we will have majority of people on that side of the frame. And this might be, or probably will be very, uh, probably a public health issue where the tests that we are doing in specialized longevity clinics right now and uh, the biomarkers that we are checking or the biological age that we are detecting in some patients, right, that they will be uh, based on a daily 
on, 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 a, on a, in a daily life, um, because that would be actually the source for public health decisions in terms of uh, health plans and so on. So perhaps we'll have not only breast cancer screenings very soon, but also biological age screenings, right? Hopefully in a very good sense. Um, so I guess at this point, the most important two slides that are coming here are the patient journey. And what is different in healthy longevity medicine to, for example, functional medicine or integrative medicine or internal medicine, right? As you would say, what is different that I do in my daily work um, in a hospital in internal medicine than in longevity? It's also about prevention or fixing problems. Well, yes, but also in addition, in healthy longevity, our framework is a little bit different because in the real world or as it is now, we are following the patient along the life journey from the birth where the patient is going through the stages of childhood and adolescence, usually screened and uh, evaluated within a range that is based on the population. And we all know the graphs for children on the weight and the height and all these periodical screenings. Um, until the person reaches the so-called optimal peak performance level, usually it's some, something around 20 or 30, of course, very individual. And from that moment on, we have a decline, right? We have a, a in adverse decline of functionality, of performance. And um, this period of time is very often affiliated with a lot of comorbidities and therefore a dispersed amount of different physicians, again, evaluating this person within their framework of specialty and within their norms of, um, of values. Meanwhile, in healthy longevity medicine, it's a bit different. Um, because we are first and above operating with biological age, or at least we are trying to. By far, it's not perfect and we are aware of it. But at the same time, we have to generate data in order to improve and scale. Therefore, as you can see here, the same graph, we are trying to use the currently available AI tools for biological age measurement. And at the time where the per person is in the decline phase, to not only have the chronological age, but the actual biological age of the patient associated with parameters that should be optimized to a specific level at this specific point of time for that specific person. And then the physician is then grabbing those parameters and try to optimize it so that the person will always be restored to the biological age of current optimal performance. So it's not about bringing an 80 years old patient biologically to, to being 20 anymore. That's not feasible and that's not rational and that's not how it works. But the AI will help us to understand what is the optimal biological age for that person in this framework at this specific point of time and uh, to guide the physician on how to get there. And of course, right now we have a variety of diagnostics that can help us with it. The interventional arm is much um, less developed, as we all know, um, but in terms of the diagnostics, we have the clinical precision diagnostic that is very abundant and on a very high level at this point, right? So we can gather 150 and more gigabytes of a patient. Some of the clinicians are integrating whole body MRI into it and very extensive oncological diagnostics. Some are skipping it fully and focusing mostly on the biological age different type of biological age measurements, but definitely everybody agrees that the functional testing should be there, imaging of the heart, and um, of course, cognition uh, in terms of tests or in terms of, so of brain quantitative measurements, microbiome, and so on. And now here I would like to just pinpoint a few of those important tasks. For example, the mitigation of the risk of disease is uh, now partially possible with uh, polygenetic risk score. So this is something that we use a lot in order to evaluate what would be the risk of a specific um, of a specific disease, usually the real global burden of disease that are causing morbidity and mortality, such as CVS, strokes, uh, dementia, and so on. Pharmacogenomics is a very important integral part, just not only for operation daily in the clinic of which is the drug to respond for a patient or not, but also in guiding further diagnostics. And of course, right now, uh, 
a plethora of uh, great monitoring and panels and point of care diagnostics from CGMs to ketamine monitorings to intermittent fasting monitorings, uh, of course, to very, very good right now also sleep monitorings, uh, also molecular pathologies that are now available very easily, liquid biopsies, cognitive diagnostics, neuronal di diagnostics, menstrual cycles for, for women and so on. Bottom line, the more we have on data and well collected data, well stored data, well evaluated data, the better for the patient in all senses. Those data can be used not only for the daily work, but also of course for um, drug development, drug discovery, targeted optimization of those, especially AI-based drug discovery. Um, here is just one of the examples of, uh, of, of, of the framework that I know where there is a very, very rapid development of a drug with the help of AI and a much faster procedure in terms of safety and efficacy. And uh, one of the labs that has been just open is from Dr. Zhavronkov in, in Shanghai, China, where uh, I have actually also been and, and, and saw it, which is very um, impressive in a sense in terms of aging. So I would just focus on that point with those types of very generic data partially made by robots in, in the labs of human samples, we are looking at the future where in a hospital, like in my hospital, there can be a mini lab, AI robotic lab connected to a cloud where I can take a sample of a human tissue or a hair or whatever I have a blood of my patient at a specific point of time, healthy or sick patient, and really have a high output diagnostics done on that specific sample in order to find either the best medication at that point of time, find resistances, or even connect with my colleagues all around the world to find a new target, synthesize it, and try it on N1 of a patient. So that is really um, extremely valuable and extremely innovative. Last few words on COVID and aging. Um, as Ilya mentioned in his opening speed, COVID has shown all of us that we not only have biological sex and gender differences, but also that we have vulnerable population of the elderly. And um, we have all you know, clinicians who have been working on the, the front line seen the pitfalls of potential therapeutics that were um, repurposed, right? In terms of, for example, um, medication that had um, double uh, substances and in the elderly caused a lot of side effects also where we didn't know how to really um, dose them, right? So the development of second and third generation um, medication, especially the 3CL pro inhibitors is very promising. A lot of them are being developed in the US and in China. Um, and there is even one third generation uh, inhibitor where one of the main focus was really to target efficacy and less toxicity for elderly patients, but elderly, including biologically aged patients. And uh, those include several factors such as bioavailability, but also resistant, um, developing of resistance and dosing. And we've looked at it already in 2020 when the pandemic just opened um, together with um, Matt Keberlein and, and several other colleagues when we were actually also proposing a trial was published in Lancet Healthy Longevity on mitigating and mounting the response to uh, COVID uh, vaccination for elderly by implementing mTOR inhibitors to those that are biologically older than uh, they are chronologically. So I guess a lot of interesting ideas since we know that aging is not consistent also in the elderly and we have different approaches at different levels from the systems to the organs and the tissues cell levels. That's also the base of the hallmarks of aging. But given this and also giving the fact, a fact that also different physiological functions are declining at a different pace and for everybody this pace is different, we end up in a longevity protocol that has to be highly individualized, that has to be highly flexible and changed accurately on a continuous basis that will include some of the diagnostics and monitorings uh, granularly, some of them once a lifetime, once a year, some of them daily. But this is something that at this point of time, at least, um, the doctor should operate together with AI for a specific patient. 
And what's helping us there is, of course, a biological age measurement. We have a lot of aging clocks that has been thematized a lot here in this conference already. Therefore, I will just mention that we have a variety of those from the photo age through microbiome age, of course, ep epigenetic methylation age, very important blood age. And now also very importantly, also development of um, behavioral based clocks uh, and cardiac clocks and many others. The question is, is there a need of an integration of all of those clocks? I'm not sure anymore. Two years ago, I would have said yes, for sure. Now I would say probably...